Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and welcome to episode 41 of the Gaming Rules Podcast. Now, I am certainly Paul Grogan. The real Paul Grogan is certainly not asleep, and this is me. I am not pretending to be someone else, and this is my podcast. I own this podcast. It is my podcast, and I'm doing the intro. I'm very happy about that. Hey, Efka, how you doing? Uh, hi. Hi, real Paul Grogan. So, you've done the intro for me, yep. Yeah, yeah, I've done the intro. It's all done very good. Very top quality professional intro. Excellent, excellent. So you mentioned that there's an interview with the guys from Man vs. Meeple later on? Y- yes, yes, I have totally mentioned that. Yep, and uh, I'm going to be announcing the winners of the Codenames competition. And that's all been done, Paul. You yep, don't cool. have to worry about that. And and you mentioned the fact that the show is sponsored by Gameslaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer. Yes, that's that's in there. You can just just play it back. You'll hear it. It's excellent, it's there. Excellent. So I'll, yeah. I'll just use your intro, and I I don't need to do anything. That's fine. fine. That's completely fine. Excellent. Right. Well, on with the show then. What Paul has played. So joining me on the show this week as co-host uh, is Efka from the No Pun Included show. Thank you for joining me again. Thank you for having me on again. Now this is the second time you've been on the show as a uh, co-host. In fact, uh, you uh, were. That's not correct. Isn't it? That's not correct. This is the first, third time I am on the podcast, actually. Uh, yeah, I, but this is the second time you've been on as a co-host. That's true. Yes, you were the first person to be a co-host. Uh, and I've got you on again, because everybody else was busy. That That's true. But I'm also kind of like a guest, and this is the second time I've been a guest, and I'm the first person to also be the second time as the guest, aren't I? Wow. Right, that's just confusing now. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) So, before we talk about uh, what we've both been playing, because this is the What Paul Has Played section, or the What Paul and Efka Has Played section, for the new listeners to the show recently who were not listening when you were last on, just tell people a little bit about um, No Pun Included and what it is. Okay, so No Pun Included is a YouTube video board game review channel that we hope is funny and uh you know irreverent and a little bit different something else uh and we really just enjoy doing that thing that we do uh it's something that we do for ourselves and we've never thought that uh we're you know anytime going to be anything of any significance but it seems that lately we've been really picking up steam so we must be doing something right so i think you- yeah i think i think so and certainly um you know i've watched pretty much all of your videos. I'm sure there's a couple that I haven't seen, but certainly the last few that I've watched, I think you've you've taken it up a notch. I'm particularly thinking of the one that you did for Scythe, um, the networks, you know, the, the way, I mean, you know, I, I go on a lot about the different types of um, YouTube channels that are out there, because hundreds of people are now doing YouTube channels about board games. A lot of them are just a guy with a table or board games behind him talking for five ten minutes and then and then that's it and then other people go the extra mile to make the the, the video you know well produced um, funny and filmed in different locations with different you know all of that sort of stuff and you certainly go that extra mile yeah I guess I mean you mentioned Scythe and we did go to another country to film like <laughs> ten yeah, seconds of a mile. joke you went a few hundred miles just to film the bit and I know I remember you telling me about it you said oh I, I, I'm flying all the way to Lithuania just to film 10 seconds of a video and I thought oh, yeah. no. and I wait I, I, you didn't actually tell me what it was until I watched the video and then I was like okay yeah that, that's quite funny <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so that was good anyway so if you've not seen the No Pun Included channel I know there's hundreds of other board game reviewers out there but please just go and have a look if there was one video you would recommend to watch which one would it be what's oh, your favourite one um, well, people uh, enjoy our Forbidden Stars review the most, but I would okay. say I would say uh, go watch our review of the networks because I think the networks. Yeah. because it's a a great game that is coming out this year or has been out. The release schedule for that game is very weird because it launched in all the conventions this year, uh, but is still not out in retail. I'm not sure. Maybe it is. Well, it, it sold out. I think so. They're doing another print run. Right. So, okay. Something that, like that. That explains yes. it. But yeah, if you can get your hands on the networks watch our video decide if you like it and then go get it because i think you will um it's it's one of those games that's very universal and it transcends pretty much genre i think in a very small way but it does that which is great yeah. hey paul can i make an announcement 
You can, yes. Awesome. Okay, so uh, one of the things I do is, uh, no pun included, together with my wife, Elaine, uh, which is a YouTube channel that we do. Uh, The other board gaming thing that I'm going to be doing, uh, which is not with Elaine, although she she said she might like to guest at some points, uh, we're doing a podcast which we haven't got a name for yet because we have a few tentative names and we're still choosing between them. Uh, But if uh, people recognize John from John Gets Games and also John from Actual Law, another funny YouTube video board game person, we're doing a podcast together with them. And this has never been mentioned anywhere before in public. So if you're exclusive, if you're listening to Paul's podcast, you will be the first to know that this is happening. And if you want to know more about it, just follow either of us like on social media either uh, John Gets Games or Actual Law or uh, No Pun Included and you'll find out more details about that when yeah, it comes out. I mean uh, I, I wouldn't recommend out. doing a podcast they're, they're, they're rubbish. Uh, Are they now? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so I mean I'll, I'll certainly be sharing that when you when you put more information available about it. Yeah, of course. So Let's go on to some of the games we've been playing. Now, for anybody who's been following me on social media, and I'm going to be mentioning this in the next section, you'll know that I've been extremely busy due to workload, so I've ended up having to cancel a number of game nights. I haven't been playing as much as I'd like to, but last night I decided that I needed a break from the work, and I managed to get my second play of Mombasa. Now, when Mombasa came out, which was Essen last year, everybody I know that was playing it said, you've got to play this, you will absolutely love it. And it took so long. I mean, I know people that played it, but it took months and months and months before I actually got round to playing it. And they were absolutely right. I'd only played it the once. I was taught how to play by a friend of mine at Manacon, which was like July this year. So it did take me a long time before I got round to it. And I've been desperate to play it again and played it again last night. Mombasa is my joint favourite game of last year, along with Nippon. Um, So all the people that recommended it to me and said that I would probably like it were absolutely right. Uh, Now, you've played it? I really like Mombasa. I have played it. It's our runner-up game of the year from last year. Oh, okay. Uh, I almost didn't pick it up. I actually, I heard about it at Spiel, but by the time I heard about it, I I had the Spiel fatigue of uh, heavy Euro (laughs) games, and I just like, no, no, another one. And then so many people were talking about it. I was like, no, I have to get this. So I went out and got it, and uh, we did our review of it. And after I did the review, I actually sold my copy to buy myself the limited edition wooden box one because I liked the game so much. And I had a chance to play it again recently. And it was the first time we actually played with the correct rules because there was one minor rule we got wrong before uh, we did our video, uh, which is that uh, there's a kind of a worker placement majority spot. So if you have the most bananas as products, you can take this spot. Most bananas, yeah. Yeah. So what we thought is that meant that it's most, not most or equal to the highest oh, okay. person, right? Yeah. And it, it's such a minute change in rules, but it actually makes the game flow so much better. And yeah. I have just uh, played a free-player game of Mombasa and absolutely loved it. It was so fluid in terms of... Uh, you just never know what's going to be good, but you kind of have to hedge your bets. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know that not everyone reviewed Mombasa positively because... Uh, I know Shut Up and Sit Down said, uh, oh, well, it's it's a very intricate game, but it's just a lot of staring at the board for a couple of hours. And I really, perfect game. Yeah, I really <laughs> disagree with that because I think uh, what uh, it is a fun game because what goes behind that is all the tension of decision-making, and I think that's very exciting. And yeah, maybe on the surface, people watching you play Mombasa might not look very exciting, but I think what's happening on the table is really, really oh, cool. Oh, absolutely. There's so yeah. many... I mean, it's very rare these days that I don't play a game and get to the end of it and go, well, it was 90%, but I'd change this bit. <laughs> and with Mombasa, I got to the end of it and I was like, yeah, I'd, 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 I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change any rules. Graphic design's really good. The gameplay's really good. It's just, yeah, really like it. If you like your medium to medium to heavy Euro games and you haven't played Mombasa yet highly recommended by me and Efka. So, the other game that I've been playing a lot of is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and this is work-related. So I'm working with uh, Istari Stroke Space Cowboys on the new version, which is coming out uh, well, it's already out in French, but the English version is coming out next year. Now, this is the Jack the Ripper and the West End Adventures. It's actually two games in one. So there's ten cases included in this game. There are ten new cases, 
Four of them are the Jack the Ripper setting, and the other six are nothing to do with Jack the Ripper whatsoever. So if you're not interested in the Jack the Ripper stuff, you can just play the six other cases. If you are interested in Jack the Ripper, you can play you can play the whole lot. Um, and although I've been playing them, we've been spending a lot of time playing them, the reason why I'm getting involved in it is that we've been finding lots and lots of errors and not just typos, but things actually wrong, things in the wrong place, things that don't make sense. So it's actually been, it's been work. But I love the Sherlock Holmes game, so it's kind of been, as we've been going through the cases, it's been an enjoyable experience that I would have got from playing the case. But then when you come across a part where it's broken because one of the dates is wrong, or, you know, the location's wrong on the map, it actually breaks down, that's where it, it's, it's low. Right, okay, th- this is work. Now, what I, I'm not saying that this game is out and it's broken and everything else. I'm involved before the game has actually gone to print. So, all of these things I'm trying to fix, but the deadline on this was quite short, and each case takes quite a long time to do, and then, of course, typing up all of the notes about it, um, and I'm finishing the last one, hopefully, this weekend. But I have been playing an awful lot of Sherlock Holmes Consulted Detective. Um, I don't know if you've played any of them. Yeah, I have, actually. You I, have, right. I, ha- I haven't played it much, but me and Elaine really like it. We have a copy of Sherlock Holmes, uh, yeah. the Istari edition. Yes. And I've definitely run into that thing where there are bugs in the game. Uh, I think our particular copy is missing a page... Uh, oh, from dear. the from the second case booklet, so there's clearly there's clearly like a section missing that should be there, right. and okay. it's very evident when you start the second case because uh, you're supposed to start with this bit and it's just not there. Yeah. Um. And uh. But I can understand how that happens with games like that that are very heavily narratively driven, but there are yes. also many many narrative branching paths, and because of how these things get written and edited. Uh, it often happens there are mistakes and it does need a good proofreader and editor to go through it which is what you're doing so you're- it, it, it is and you know I'm not just I'm not just proofreading and editing the text I'm playing through the scenarios and even when I've finished the scenario I am then reading through every single clue point and going well why would you go here how does this link to that and in in one of the cases that I've been testing there's a there's a clue point for example and I was like I've no idea why you would go here and I spoke to the publisher and they went well, there's a link in the newspaper. And I'm like, no, that link's not in the newspaper. And they went, oh, yeah, we removed that link from the newspaper. And I'm like, well, in which case, because that clue point wasn't that relevant. Right, well, we need to remove the clue point kind of thing. So, you know, all of this stuff will be fixed by the time it, it goes to print. It's just, um, it, you know, it, it's been a heck of a lot of work in the last in the last couple of weeks about that. So, yeah, so I've not been playing very much, but as I say, played Mombasa last night, really happy with that. What about you? What games have you been playing? Well, I've I've also kind of been playing one game a lot. I've been playing a lot of Seafall. Yes. I've been very lucky to get an early copy of Seafall. Uh, thanks How to How did you get that copy? Thanks to some guy called Paul Grogan. Never heard. Um, and also another person called Michael Fox, uh, who happily freighted it over and bought it for me at Gen yep. Con. And, and now we have it and we're playing it. Uh, now, I've posted a first impressions video where I raved about Seafall because I did really enjoy the prologue and my first game of it and everyone on the table did equally right. and uh, and not so much since I have actually if I said I love Seafall then I think there has been some sort of a falling out a little bit with it um, but that's I think that's very peculiar because a lot of the reviewers had a very opposite reaction like uh, the dice tower initially yeah. didn't didn't like the first episode and i've talked to tom and he said i actually quite like it now um yeah. and uh and for me it's it's a little bit of the opposite i i think the thing about seafall uh, that i think most people would like to know is w- will i enjoy this game well the answer is simple uh, you will enjoy this game if it's the sort of game that you're looking for, and it's a, it, <laughs> yeah. it's 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 simple to say, but it's it's basically a epic uh, campaign style, uh, sort of heavy issue with a lot of player interaction, a lot of aggression, uh, some uh, and not just some, quite a big amount of randomness, and uh, if that's what you're looking for, you will find a game that's not perfect but mm-hmm. that you will enjoy playing, right? If you want that campaign experience with your friends to go over the same game more and more and see it develop, 
you will like it. There are things that certainly aren't perfect about it. For example, in our last game, uh, uh, the winning score, the score that you need to reach for the game to end is 13 points. And I made a mistake because I interpreted the rules wrong and we find out the rules don't actually work the way I thought they did. And in, in consequence of that, I have had a seven point swing. So wow. I, I went down from being 11, what would have been 11 points to four points. Okay. And uh, I came in last. And right. on the campaign scale, I was first at the time and now I'm fourth. So things like that can happen in Seafall and you kind of have to go in to Seafall being okay with that. Yeah. I mean, I was on the fence about this one because I'd just come out the back of playing the whole Pandemic Legacy with a group mm-hmm. of people and we were after the next Legacy game. That was the next Legacy game. I was all set to go to Gen Con to pick up, obviously, a copy for you and a copy for me. And everything that I've read about it since, I'm glad I didn't. Um, I, I don't think it would have been worth my time, considering you know, e- each game takes quite a while because it's a it's a medium to heavy euro isn't it it, it is it is something yeah. like it starts as a medium to heavy euro but uh, as the game progresses it becomes more and more interactive right. and slightly more and more random slightly more and more aggressive towards each other yeah you see there, there there's three words that have just put me off straight away <laughs> a- aggressive high levels of interaction between the players and random yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm glad I, I've. Pa- I mean, I, I. I watched the short up and sit down review about it. This is twice we've mentioned them in this in this podcast. Mm-hmm. But they played a few games and then they went. Shall we bother finishing? Nah, it's not worth our time. We've got many many other games to play. And I'm a completionist. Once I've started something, I've watched TV series that I absolutely hated after like <laughs> six or seven episodes that I then had to watch till the end because I can't. I can't not finish it. So for them. You know, and I think I'd feel the same as them. I'd play the few games, and I'd be like, "Okay, really, do we have to meet up every week for the next ten weeks and play this? Because it's going to take all of our time." So, anyway, I used to I used to do that with books, uh, where right. uh, I had to finish a book no matter how bad it was. I don't do that anymore, and I'm really glad I don't. But just on a final note, I I probably we probably will finish Seafall because we're yeah. still enjoying it, right? If you're still enjoying it, then yeah. fine. Yeah. So next game. Next game. Okay, you will hate this game. Uh, (laughs) It it is the silliest game I have played in my entire life. It is called The Free Commandments. It's a very old game by Friedman Fries. I've heard about this on one of the Dice Tower Top 10s, Z briefly mentioning it. And just from his description, I was like, I have to get this game. So I went on BoardGameGeek and found it for a fiver. uh, Plus plus Okay. And uh, apparently it's so cheap because it used to be in the works. And for those of who are oh, non, yeah, yeah. non-UK listeners. There's this shop that works that doesn't sell board games. It's a chain. But you can often find bargain bin board games. I mean, the stuff that's been universally considered bad, you can find it there for like... I would f- disagree. There's a lot of been, there's been a lot of good games in the works. Oh, but that's changed then. Yeah. Over-produced. So a couple of years ago, there was a lot of good games that were appearing in, in the works that were going for like five pound because they were just overproduced. There was thousands of them still in a warehouse. They sold and them no off. one's buying them. Nobody's buying them. And they went in the works and it was like Priests of Ra, Scylla from Istari Games. There was quite yes. a few. Okay, so, so maybe redefine that definition and say, not bad <laughs> games, but games that no one's buying. Right? Yes. Uh, and yeah, so Friedman Fries uh, and two other designers, I can't remember their names, uh, uh, and the game is effectively uh, oh how do I describe this this is complete nonsense okay so basically one of you is always a high priestess and uh, that position rotates each round and the other players are acolytes now the high priestess comes up with three commandments and those commandments come from the four cards that you draw you draw four cards you discard one you keep the other three and then you designate secretly two commandments that are good and one commandment that is bad and the commandments are really bizarre things like talking to a person that's not playing this game standing up from standing up moving away from the table singing dancing uh involving your nose involving your hair licking okay. something uh, I can see where this is going yeah and and you as a player as an acolyte you know that there are commandments and you want to score points and the high priestess scores a number of points equal to the highest scoring acolyte 
you want to score points, but you don't know what you're scoring for. You just know that once you've done a thing, and the thing that you do is you pick up this piece from the table and then you put it down. And in between picking it up and putting it down, you can do anything you like. <laughs> uh, but what ends up happening is because people know that they've triggered something, because the, the high priestess will say, yeah, this card has been triggered. Um, they will effectively proceed doing everything that they remember is on the cards. Okay. And a, a turn will often involve singing, dancing, spinning, and just doing everything imaginable. And I will say that this is not a game, and this isn't a game you should probably go out and seek and buy, but if you can find it for a fiver like me, I highly recommend getting it and then playing it once and forgetting it. But but just preface your players that this is the stupidest game you will right. ever play. Okay. Yeah, and you'll have so, a lot of fun. So that's three commandments. What next? Uh, well, I've been playing a lot of Captain Sonar mm -hmm. and uh, I have not won once yet um and this is very peculiar i really like captain sonar i did a review of it very very recently and uh it's just like nothing else that i've ever played and i think everyone who's played it so far has enjoyed it at least people who have played it with me and i know a lot of reviewers who have also really enjoyed that game mm -hmm. it's a real-time game uh four versus four team game where you're in a submarine and it's kind of like battleship but a game version of yes. Battleship. Yeah, yeah. I'm playing on Tuesday. If I can make it to the club on Tuesday, one of the uh, one of the people has has just got got his copy and said he's bringing it down, and I've I've booked a space in it. So uh, I'm hopefully going to get a chance to play it myself. It's fantastic because every role feels so different, and you're playing a different game to everyone else, but your game is connected to everyone else's okay. game. And not how long just does a game take? About 40 minutes. It really depends. Okay. It depends on how good your radio operator is. Definitely give the radio operator position to the person who's... How do I say this politely? Most with it. Uh, okay. And, and they, they need to be. Because if your radio operator keeps making mistakes, then you can't find the enemy submarine. Oh, and if okay. you can't find the enemy submarine, then no one can kill the enemy submarine. Right. And uh, yeah, it's, it's also exciting because... The decisions that you make in the game, they feel like they have a narrative connection to the theme. The theme does not feel pasted on, even though you just have some maps and markers and a screen between you. It's right. it's something else entirely. It's absolutely excellent. Okay, yeah, as I say, I'm looking forward to playing that on Tuesday. So that's some of the games that we've been playing recently, and uh, thanks for joining me on this section. Oh, it was a pleasure. Special guest. So I'm very thrilled to welcome to the show uh, Jeremy and David from Man vs. Meeple, which is a relatively new thing, but it exploded onto my computer monitor uh, a couple of months ago now. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks a lot. Super excited to be here. Cool. So some listeners will already know what Man vs. Meeple is, but for those who don't, just give me a quick summary of what it is. Take it away, Jeremy. You want me to do it? I'll do sure. it. So I've been in the... Uh, a board game industry yeah. for a while doing reviews and whatnot yeah, under the moniker Dragon Strike. Uh, I did a lot of videos on BGG in 2010, 2011, and then I quickly disappeared into nothingness. Uh, I never stopped playing board games, but I always had the desire to keep doing videos again for the community. So probably early 2016, I had this envisionment of doing something that was more akin to what the board game industry or the video game industry was doing with their video reviews. Yeah, we, Jeremy and I are big fans of a lot of different types of YouTube broadcasting. We'd seen some stuff that covers video games, some stuff that covers movies and film that we thought, and you know, we we're both board games fan, board game fans, so we thought. You know, that's a pretty interesting formula that could be pit applied to the board game uh, segment. So we were we loved consuming that content, so we thought, let's try to create that type of content for board game fans as well. Yeah, okay. so we kind of wrote it down on a piece of paper and drafted it out and spent about six months building the set and just trying to decide on what kind of show we wanted to have and how it would be different than anyone else in the market right now. That's the thing, because it is different 
and that you know there's so many people out there with their own YouTube channels now you have gone for something different so it's interesting that you you got the idea for that based on watching other YouTube channels from a from something other than the board game industry yeah right. basically we we wanted to see and we we like all the board game channels that are out there there's just there's a, a wide variety but we wanted to a lot like Jeremy's old videos that he did when he did the components breakdowns is drag and strike uh, sort of definitely do it at a high level of quality with a lot of polish, um, which is where the set really comes in to a large degree. Mm -hmm. But we wanted we wanted to mix that with also a comfortable and casual sort of conversational aspect, which is, you know, if you've seen the channel, how Jeremy and I kind of just go back yeah. and forth between each other. So it feels a little... It's something we like to think that people can watch, but not necessarily keep their eyes glued to the television. They could mm -hmm. they could look away for a minute and still just kind of hear us talking and still sort of get some stuff from that. So it's a it's a it's a mixture of both, and hopefully so far so good. We think it's getting a fairly good reception, so we're pleased so far. Yeah, and we also really wanted to focus towards the consumers and the publishers. We know that a lot of the publishers spend. A heck of a lot of money on art and design and a lot of the current reviewers in the industry don't spend a whole lot of time showing those assets that they have built into their game so we wanted to have a platform to be able to show those on the screens and let the consumers also see those cards and those components in a uh, in a really vivid light which they currently may not or may or may not be seeing prior to a game's release yeah. Okay, so it's primarily a review channel, or is it only a review channel? Uh, primarily. We're, we're, we're not... I mean, we set out with some definite, like, goals and guidelines. We thought, okay, we'll not do this, we'll just do this. But as we've gone, we found our minds opening a little bit more to a few different things. You'll, you'll certainly see some different types of programming from us. Um, yeah. But, you know, I would say it's fair to say primarily it's going to revolve around board game reviews. Yeah. Well, yeah, we that is that is very true, but we're also kind of branching out to some Kickstarter previews for yeah. companies that have approached us. Uh, we're also getting ready to launch something in two weeks um, that is very, very special to the board game industry. It'll be a year-long commitment by us. It's something we can't really talk about right now, but we'll announce it in the next coming week. It's uh, exciting for us, and I think it'll be exciting for retailers, publishers, consumers, and distributors. In yeah, I was kind of yeah. hoping when I when I um, got you on the show that you would have announced that already, so we could, <laughs> we could then talk about it. Unfortunately, yeah, the timing was was slightly out. So basically, yeah, watch watch this space. So I'm hoping that a number of listeners right now are going to your Man vs. Meeple YouTube channel and and finding out what it is. Jeremy, can I just take you back a few years? Sure. A lot of people will formally know you as Dragon Strike, and I think it's fair to say. I've said this in public before, so I'm not just saying it because you're on the show, but your videos that you put out were very professionally done. But then, as you say, it all went quiet for a while, and then Man vs. Meeple has been born. And you touched on this earlier on, is the quality. And you'll know if you've seen any of my videos, I, I put quality above above everything else. And, you know, going back to what I said about there's hundreds of people with YouTube channels nothing against them but a lot of people are doing this in their spare time and they get a table and they turn the lights on and they press record and when i first saw the the, the you know the first man versus meeple one when i when i went on and saw it i went my god you've built a television studio <laughs> and you know you guys have sat down and you said it took you six months to build this studio and it, it looks amazing um, and I thought you, you you must have hired a TV studio or something to do this, but no, you you you've built it yourself. Yeah, we like to think that a lot of people have asked us, you know, how many people are in the room when you're doing that because you know we're using multi-camera and things like yeah. that, and and this day we live in, there's so much you can do with a smaller team. I mean, we it's literally just me and Jeremy in his studio based in his basement. Um, with some cameras, and then it's a lot of post. Yeah, I mean, right. I don't want to give ourselves too much credit. There's a lot of people like us out there, including you, Paul, and I, I look to Rodney and some other people that have zero experience in the editing world. <laughs> I have zero technical experience, uh, right. and so does David. We're self-taught with everything we've done. Yeah. 
even the construction of this set, I have never built anything in my entire life. So it took right. quite a bit of time to even plan it out and figure out how to use a router, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and a nail gun and all the other things that were required. So uh, it's, a, it's a true labor of love. And I know you feel that. I know people like Rodney feel that when they create that, we're not creating it because uh, we are technical ex experts by any means or we've gone to training or we've had education behind it. We just love the board game industry like you. And we really wanted to create something special. Um, yeah, right. I mean, not just love of the board game industry, but we, you know, I think we all share a passion to put out something uh, that really pushes the buttons that, you know, when we're watching other things. For instance, Paul, I mean, I've watched many of your uh, videos and the graphic work you do where you're highlighting components and highlighting sections of the board and things like that. That's exactly the kind of thing that I appreciate as a consumer of content because I'm not just... I, I won't just read anything, I won't just listen to anything, but I need that visual element too. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people uh, don't really think about how much that helps. Like, you can just put a tiny little bit of visual in over your talking, and it makes it ten times better. Even though it may not feel that way to people, it really is. And I yeah. don't think people really appreciate in general how long this process takes <laughs> for anybody involved. I mean, when yeah. people consume these videos, they think it's a simple, hey, they pressed record and they did a couple things. These videos that we do, that you do, take hours of our time. Yeah. Um, we have four things that we've filmed and I am scared because I don't know when I'm going to have time to to, to do post editing and all these other things we want to do you with them, they just take a lot of time to do. You, yeah. you know what? We're we're also though gluttons for that punishment because, <laughs> you know, in one in one side of the mouth we want to complain like, oh my gosh, that was so much work. But the other time, I'm up till like two or three in the morning and not even realizing how late it is because yeah. I ha it's in a weird way I have so much fun working in the the editing software and After Effects and building those things, um, and it's so satisfying until you know. People, I show it to someone in my life, and and they don't really notice all the work that went into like <laughs> three seconds of of, of video. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know exactly how that feels. The <laughs> amount of time that just goes into, you know, as you say, something like a three second thing. You know, I I, I animated yeah. a load of pieces all dropping on a particular space at a particular time, and that took about two hours to do. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's crazy. And then I, I got the lighting right, and the shadow right, and the ambient inclusion setting, just so I thought it looked good. Nobody cares. Exactly. Yeah, I could have turned the shadows off. It's, but it's beautiful. <laughs> you know what, Paul? You you can count on at least two two other people in the world will watch those things and Excellent. will appreciate it. I'll send you an email every time. <laughs> Excellent. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, David, what was your background then before getting into this with Jeremy, because Jeremy did the whole Dragon Strike thing before. You know, it's 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 interesting. Jeremy and I have like crossed paths a few times. I used to be in the publishing industry. I published right. uh, strategy guides for years and years and years in the video game space. Oh yeah. So I've always been uh, a gamer. You know, as far back as I can remember, uh, some board games as a kid, but then more video games and and that that side of things for the rest of my life. And interestingly enough. Uh, when I was working at uh, the publisher, there were some guys that worked there for me that were heavily into board games, and they would try to introduce me to them. And I was that guy that would sit at the table and hear 10 seconds of rules explanation and go, nope. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I tuned out. And I was exactly the people today that I get frustrated with that are at my table right. when I'm trying to explain the game. Because now... It's completely opposite. I've become so fascinated with rules and mechanics and how they work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can read a rule book now and just be fascinated by like, oh, wow, that sounds like such a cool mechanic. Um, so uh, I've gotten more and more into the board game side of things. Jeremy and I bumped into each other a few times throughout our lives. Uh, even before I knew he was Drakenstrike, I'd okay. probably seen some of his videos. And then, I don't know, it was probably about two, three years ago, we started kind of hanging out, playing some games every once in a while. Um, I know, I knew at that time he'd been doing the Dragon Strike, uh, Dragon Strike stuff back in the past. So I, like everyone else, was like, man, you got to get back into that. So that's part of how this started coming along. And, uh, you know, here we are. 
Yeah. So one thing that surprised me, obviously, when I when I first went onto your channel and I started looking at the stuff and I realised the quality and I know how long that takes, and you were putting out a lot of content. Now, Jeremy, you've recently made the scary jump, I believe, mm -hmm. and you have left your full-time job and you now have this as your full-time thing. David, what were you doing before? Or was has this been full-time for you for a while? Well... Not really full time. I have a small sort of local business now that I run, it's still in the gaming uh, side of things, mm -hmm. uh, teaching game design and and having parties and events revolving around video games, things oh, like cool. that. But it uh, now that Man vs. Meeple is really getting some steam behind it, um, that's probably going to be secondary to our efforts on this. I mean, Jeremy and I, for the last week and a half, for sure. Uh, his home has now become my office. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've been over in the morning and gone at dinner time. So uh, right now, Man vs. Meeple is the focus for sure. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's a full-time thing for you now, Jeremy, as well. It is. Well, uh, hopefully it pans out. We have some very good prospects. We're making roads with a lot of publishers. And, uh, you know, this like I said, this is a passion for us. My, I have a very supporting family who... Hopefully we'll stick with me <laughs> long enough. So to far see they're fruition. supporting. They're, yeah, so far they're supporting. No, they've been they've been very good, and uh, you know now I'm around. I have two kids, so I can spend more time with them, get them off the bus, and then. Uh, just spent a lot more time with my family. I was working uh, downtown Indianapolis, which is about an hour and 15 minutes from where I am now. So that drive alone was a huge Every portion day. of my day. So I was gone 10, 11 hours out of the day. And it was yeah. just, it was difficult to do both things at the same time. And really, if I wanted to push this, I mean, if you're going to build a set in your basement, <laughs> you kind of got to do it full time he's, from now on he's, out. He's committed. He's pot committed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so moving on to other things. I normally ask... Uh, each of my guests who come on the show just a little bit about themselves um so you've mentioned that you live near indianapolis mm -hmm. and how long have you been into the gaming hobby then oh my i yeah. how, how many times have you been to gen con jeremy uh this year was my 21st year at gen con okay. so okay. i've been going for a long time i've been a video gamer and a board gamer primarily my entire life i mean i remember being very young and having uh, an Apple and Activision Commodore 64, mm -hmm. getting Dungeon. Uh, yeah, when I was very yeah. little playing with my sister. So I've been a gamer my entire life. Right, and David? I've well, in terms of Gen Con, I've probably been to Gen Con the last six or so years. Uh, the first couple years, I was that timid guy who walked around not knowing whether or not I could even sit down at a table and play a game. Right. Um, uh, thankfully, that's changed, but uh, I've been into board games pretty heavily for those six years, and now, you know, what had started off with uh, sort of a different taste, I think Jeremy would say the same thing, my tastes in games have definitely changed over the years. Mm -hmm. I was always fascinated, sort of on the periphery, walking by tables full of miniatures and those sort of dice-chucking games, and just being interested, but not bold enough to sit down and try them. And now... <laughs> that I know a lot more about uh, all the games out there. I'm I'm much more of a Euro kind of guy. Uh, you know, a good medium weight Euro is right in my wheelhouse. And those miniatures games, while they're beautiful, probably not not at the top of my list. Yeah, yeah. we're both very much strategic gamers. Uh, I favor strategy over luck. Yeah, I, like I do like I do like some good dice chucking. You just got to uh, has to have some mitigation to it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I actually wrote an article a couple of years ago um, about dice in games and how I feel about them. To summarise, if you make a decision and then roll dice to see whether it works or not, not for me. Yeah, <laughs> I am right there if, with you. If, if you roll dice and then make decisions based on what those dice are, i.e. they give you choices and you can possibly modify the dice. So, you know, I'm a big Stefan Feld fan and a lot of his games use dice and I love the games and you know yeah. 10 years ago people used to put a dice near me thinking that I'd actually you know have a mental fit and <laughs> be scared and run away and now dice in games when used properly absolutely love them so the dice selection that we've had um, yeah. and things like that I, it's just yeah I mean, my tastes in games have, have definitely changed as well I'm a medium to heavy Euro gamer. I'm right there with you. Though in the last year, year and a half, I've probably gone more down to the medium. Oh, okay. I'm still I'm still in the medium to heavy, but I'm not 
So, for example, Arkwright. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's way on the heavy side. Right, it's probably an amazing game. And four years ago, I would have got that game and loved it and played the hell out of it. Now I've played half a game and gone. Eh. <laughs> actually, I, I, I'll I'll stick with my uh, Nippons and Madeiras, and although Madeira is pretty heavy, you know, I'll stick. I'll, I'll I'll take it down a notch because I'll get it played a lot more. And I'll be able to teach it a lot more to a lot more people. That's a great point, too, when you said you, that you'll be able to teach it to more people. My gaming tastes revolve around that quite a bit because I'm often playing with family and different age groups, my right. sons and whatnot, and people who aren't hardcore into board gaming. So those medium weight games are just far more usable, uh, mm-hmm. far more playable. Um, and nothing against those heavier ones. They're fantastic games. Mm-hmm. Um, they just wouldn't be my go-to for sure. Right? Yeah. Right. Now, um, what's in the pipeline? Apart from the top secret thing that you can't tell us about, or is is that the only thing that's in the pipeline for Man vs. Meeple? Oh, well, I mean, aside from a handful of games, I'm trying to like think right now what we can and can't well, say we definitely about. want to branch out and to do some more fun uh, type things get away from always doing uh, hardcore reviews and doing overlays doing some top tens and some yeah. you know type things that will involve our audience a little bit more we got to find ways to grow our audience uh, yeah. that's one thing we're trying to do for sure uh, we've had very very steady growth over the past two months that we've been active and of course, we brought over some people from my old subscriber base. Yeah. But I mean, the trajectory right now is very good for us. Um, it's just a matter of trying to carve out a niche that is unique to our show and some other some things that we can do with our show, having a TV on set, maybe Skyping right. some people in, uh, having designers and publishers uh, on set that you've seen. Uh, we have the perfect platform for publishers to come. Uh, talk about their games um so more things along that line okay yeah, so I, I would say all of the new types of content that we'll be doing i mean one of the things that jeremy and i will always set out to do is to do things in a not necessarily just a different way mm-hmm. but in a way that we would like to see them done uh and in many cases that does imply that it would be a little bit different than what what you might see out there from other people. So if we were to do a playthrough, which is not something, you know, at the very beginning, that would be the kind of thing that was very near the bottom of our list to do, mm-hmm. a full-on playthrough. Um, but however, uh, treating this you know, more from the business side of things and looking at our subscriber base and trying to grow that, we do need to kind of consider, okay, what is it that people want to see? Because maybe they want to see us playing through a game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It may not have been something we wanted to do at first, but... Maybe we could and do that and try that. You know, we did some unboxings early on Mm -hmm. that was something that was definitely not on our radar at first. And some of those unboxings, if you hit at the right time with the right title, you know, again, from a subscriber-based standpoint, it's fantastic. And we got a lot of great feedback from our viewers that they like to see that stuff. So it's been great to use social media and even in the comments on YouTube just to go back and forth. It's kind of addictive, uh, actually, to, to communicate with all the people who are watching and hear what they want to see. Mm-hmm. You know, we got a lot of help early on and constructive criticism about our audio and things like that that was right. helpful. Um, but everything we're going to be doing is going to try to take advantage of the core aspect of what we're doing here with the set, mm-hmm. with the TV, and sort of our format, that casual back and forth. As much as we can keep that going through all of our program, we probably will. Yeah, and try to continue with the high production values that we're doing, right. you know, as much as we can on every show that we can. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you certainly, from my point of view, you don't need to worry about the, the, the production values. It's interesting what you were saying about the um, finding the right mix and balance between, hang on a minute, we're watching something that has, has been professionally produced here when you're watching it, but actually it's two guys chatting. And you've, right. got, you've got the friendliness and you've got the banter. And I'll, and I'll be honest with you, when I'm watching my videos back, I, I, I hate them. Because, I, <laughs> I, you know, yeah, yeah, the visuals are all great and the graphics are all fancy. And then I'm there talking to people. And I'm so nervous every time I'm doing it. And I've probably done that line like 20 times and I'm on take 25 or whatever, that it doesn't come across naturally. It comes across, when, when I'm looking at myself anyway, it comes across as oh, I'm a bit nervous, I'm a bit tense, and the delivery is not quite right. You're probably being a little hard on yourself. Oh, yeah, well, we, no, I understand exactly what you're saying, Paul, because the, the news that we have coming out in the next couple of weeks um, 
gears around that same thing. We tried that aspect. We tried being very newsy with our and scripted, appro- very mm-hmm. scripted with our approach, and that works if you're off camera. Unless you're a really good reporter, and we're not reporters. We're just two guys who love to play games. So we found that the best way to communicate that is just to be natural, uh, yep. who we are. Uh, when we took on that corporate uh, you know, that corporate presentation, it just felt all wrong to us. Yeah, it, okay. felt really, it felt really stiff, but, I mean, with that said, like, uh, I think you and people like Rodney, too, pull that off really well. Yeah. I mean, honestly, Paul, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on your podcast, I wish you did more videos for more games because I really, I watched your Grand to... Austria one. That was one of the ones I really remember watching because that game came out and I just ended up loving it. And your video is one of the things that made me want to go out and get Ma- it. Maybe we should film ourselves and have him edit it for us. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, because there's another five minutes in every day that I could not believe <laughs> <so>. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it sounds great, and I hope people who are listening to this podcast who, who don't know, who've not heard of you, go on now. If you consume board game review channels on YouTube, definitely go and check out Man vs. Meeple. Um, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So, just to wrap things up, uh, before you go, I ran a competition last week where people could win uh, copies of Codenames Pictures, because that's just been released in the UK. So I've got two copies to give away. I've had 68 entries, and I just need you to both pick a number between 1 and 68, and then after I finish recording this section, I'll go and look that up on my list and work out who's oh. won. So I, pick some I numbers, like and I will... So each, each of us get to pick one number? Each of you gets to pick one number, and then I'll work out later who that who that is. Mm. Jeremy, take it away with your number. I'll pick uh, unlucky number 13 because 13. that's the letter M in the alphabet for man versus meeple. There oh, we go. Wow. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not nearly as sophisticated <laughs> with my choice. What letter is V? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I can't do the math on the letter V that quickly. So I'm going to go with 37. 37. Right. Excellent. Thank you very much. No for rhyme or reason. Will. I will get those winners uh, worked out uh, awesome. in the next section. So, anything else you wanted to uh, to add? No, I. You know, thanks a lot for having us on. We really appreciate it. You know, just two months ago, uh, walking around Gen Con, there was very little awareness of who Man vs. Meeple uh, was, and it's nice that we're able to get on things like this to spread the word, and we really appreciate that a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I mean, I, I feel bad because... You know, I, I when I when I spoke to Jeremy after Gen Con, I bumped into you at Gen Con and was chatting <laughs> with you. And I yeah. think a week or two before, I'd heard of all this man versus meeple stuff being talked about, but hadn't looked into it, didn't make the connection, and then afterwards went, "Oh, wait a minute, <laughs> that's you! I didn't know that was you. Sorry." And I was chatting with you, and I'd, I'd absolutely no idea. So I felt terrible about that, but it was just because uh, I, you know, I, I I hadn't got round to watching anything and hadn't made the connection but now I'm sure. now I'm fully up to speed with it and uh, yeah definitely want to support you guys I mean everybody who who knows me knows that I like quality stuff and as soon as as I say first time I watched your video and went my god they've built a TV studio the professional quality of that production just made me go right thumbs up and you know I'll, I'll, I'll help you out with whatever I can I can do nice so, thank you very well, much we, we really appreciate it absolutely that's alright so yeah thank you very much for giving up your time coming on the show and uh, we best both get back to our respective videos and rule books that we're doing indeed <laughs> <laughs> thanks Paul okay I'll see you guys next time All thanks right. bye Gaming Rules News. I'm going to try and keep this section brief this week as I've been working pretty much flat out on so many things. Um, So I'm going to use this part of the podcast just to let you know about the competition winners from last time. So as you heard in the previous section, David and Jeremy picked two numbers for me uh, from all the entries. I put all of the entries into a spreadsheet, randomly sorted it, just so there was no advantage of when you entered the competition. And the two winners are Torin Spence and Aviv Orr. Now, I've contacted both of these to let them know already, and I'll be sending out their copies of Codenames Pictures this week. It actually turns out that uh, Aviv is the illustrator behind the webcomic Up to Four Players. Now, I've actually seen a few of these webcomics myself, including one for Codenames, which was brilliant, and I remember sharing it at the time. So, I highly recommend visiting uptofourplayers.com, that's all letters, no numbers in it, uh, for some amusing webcomic stuff. The competition that I'm running at the moment for Fabled Fruit, the one from last time, that's still running. I'm going to pick that winner next time. So if you still want to enter that, good time to do that. As I say, details are still in uh, in the previous podcast. 
Now, on the next podcast, I'm going to be speaking with Peter from Inside the Box Games, or ITB Games. He hosted a tabletop jam recently in London, in fact, this weekend just gone, which is something that I really, really wanted to be at and really should have been at working in the board games industry in the UK. However, it was wake up, work on rule books, go to sleep. That was pretty much my life at the moment. So I wasn't able to attend it. But I've got Peter on the show to talk about how it went and uh, I'm looking forward to that. So that'll be on the next time. Also, I've got that Efka guy on again, and we're going to be chatting about some of the new releases that are going to, going to be coming out at Essen, because the next podcast, Podcast 42, will be going live the day before I fly out to Essen, I believe. So that's something, uh, that's something to look forward to, hopefully. So thanks again to the sponsors of the show, GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com, Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for all of the music used in this podcast, and again to SDVM Games for providing me with the copies of Codenames Pictures, which I've given out in the competition. Take care, and thanks for listening.